first, I want to talk a little bit about an event that happened yesterday here in the right. state of California. There was a hearing about the insurance mandate that, that went into effect a year ago last July 1st mm -hmm. and that has now been extended until 2017. Mm -hmm. And I know I got to watch about a half an hour of it. It was very emotional and moving, the part that I watched. And so you, you were there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what was so your takeaway? You, what did you watch? Did you watch the parents? I watched the, the last half hour of it. Which was the parent would have it was been a lot of open to the public. Yes. Right? So Obviously. there were some parents from Orange County that were so moving. There was one individual with autism who who spoke, right. um, at, which was very moving. There were a lot of uh, professionals who were speaking about very specific things, uh, funding for yeah. Uh, I have to underprivileged. go back and I have to go back and see those because that occurred right after. I finished testifying, and mm -hmm. I had to just when I finished testifying, the whole the actual uh, hearing was over at that point mm -hmm. because uh, it was the last person was the, the representative from the health uh, insurances, and he came right after me, and I had to leave for the airport. But so it was a great hearing, and it was really intended to talk about the effect of a Senate Bill 946 and how it has changed California and. Um, of course, the you know there was representation from the regional centers and DDS. Uh, the new director of DDS uh, was there, and he's a lovely gentleman. Oh, um, I really look forward to going and meeting with him again. Um, and there were a lot of uh, there was so there was representation from DDS, and then there was some uh, presentation of data, which I don't think was quite accurate. But nevertheless, they were just trying to tell us that they are there's a company that's trying to take records now on data about of how many children are now receiving services and how SB 946 has changed and increased access mm -hmm. essentially and then there was representation from um, of course the parents and the Autism Society and uh, that's Marsha Eichelberger who is the yes. current president of the Autism Society for California and I'm definitely we're gonna get Marsha to come on I've yeah. known Marsha for a hundred years <laughs> and she's she's a fantastic mom uh -huh. and just an incredible advocate for families and uh, she was accompanied by Beth Burke and um, Kristen Jacobson and, and Kristen Jacobson is also a very very um, effective advocate for families and she they they did a fabulous job in my mind they were the best um, Rick Rollins spoke also on behalf of uh, the Association for Regional Centers the ARCA mm -hmm. and um, I spoke uh, to represent the providers perspective and then there was a gentleman who also spoke to uh, or testified on behalf of the health uh, um, insurance uh, organizations and it was really good I think the majority of what came up was uh, everyone thankfully we more or less all had similar issues or the same issue the one issue that went across the board that everyone seemed to be struggling with um, what is the copay issue we all raised that as a big problem yeah. and while SB 946 has clearly increased access, obviously, to families, and there are still issues with, of course, families that can't gain access still, but yeah. the biggest issue, I think, is those that who do receive uh, coverage, but they uh, decline their coverage or they reduce their hours because they can't afford the co-pays, co-insurance, or deductibles. Yeah. And, of course, AB 89 from last year prevents the regional centers right now to contrib from contributing to to the deductibles and it also says you know we, the law basically says that the regional center may contribute to the co-pays you know and all of us were asking and even ARCA you know the Association for Regional Centers was saying they would be they would appreciate they want to have the opportunity to help cover some of these other um, and so you know they were supporting the repealing of AB 89 as well so that was wonderful to hear the concept being that you know the families should have access obviously but we really want them to uh, be able to uh, uh, share the cost and not have to pay for it themselves and have the regional centers kick in so that's a very important thing and so that issue came up several times other issues that were important that came up I feel were things like the delays in the process of getting insurance funding and a lot of people talked about that I did as well uh, you know some of the essentially the delay tactics I would say that are used by the health carriers the insurance carriers and so um, I think uh, those issues were discussed quite a bit. 
Uh, let's see what else we discussed. Um, some tests that are being administered for te for insurance that are not even supposed to be like cognitive measures I mean, all the different things that are said in terms of the, uh, insurance not being medically necessary you know or services not being medically necessary those that's all illegal you know yeah. they're not supposed to be doing that and um i, I brought up in particular uh, the whole the perspective of uh, Senator Leno, who was there, who is involved with the uh, budget committee for SB nine four six, was very very awesome to have him there. His questions were so pertinent, and he brought up a lot of different things in regards to how you know the compensation that providers receive. And um, one of the the important things I brought up, which was received well by Senator Steinberg, and he actually asked the, the health insurance representative about this, is the IMR situation, the Independent Medical Review. Mm -hmm. The concern that we as providers have had, or I particularly am very sort of concerned about this, is that the people that do the ind independent medical review are extremely, they have absolutely no idea what ABA is. Right. And so, you know, it's fine to have people that are, who are um, <clears throat> outside the field, let's say, as long as they're informed of yeah. what we do. A lot of these people have absolutely no clue what ABA is. So right. how am I gonna have a discussion with someone, you know, a neurologist or a psychiatrist who thinks ABA occurs one hour a week and right. is like speech therapy. So, you know, those types of things are problematic. So, um, yeah, we'll see. How it goes. It was very good, and I, unfortunately, I had to leave. And I did hear that there was a lot of public comments afterwards. So, and I, and I only got to see a half an hour of it, but it was very moving. And and they talked about a lot of the same things that you just mentioned. And of course, it was a, a very hot topic among the families. Right. Uh, was the medical? There were, there were a huge yes. group of people who were saying, "Please, we had." services we've lost them yes and it's life-changing yes. and senator steinberg gave an explanation for the first time about where where that was and how much he desired for it to be a part of and that budgetary constraints didn't allow it but that he is hoping that and and he put out a plea and said i will need all of your help to get this passed right. and i heard that very distinctly and you know i, I know uh nancy is with nancy Osbaugh jackson is with me on this anything that we can do do to help that because to say that our financially strapped parents who have so many other issues on top of autism that they not get the most needed help right. uh, is devastating to me so yeah. I'm hoping that with Senator Steinberg's help that and he said I he said very clearly I have heard you on this uh, there were families who drove down from Orange County and most of them were um, families that English is a second language and they stood and talked and, and in one one case they had the son get up and speak and it was just I think it was a very emotional moment for everybody that's wonderful yeah so hopefully you know I I felt uh, I wanted to have seen the whole thing, but I felt very encouraged. I'm glad that they had the hearing. I think it was important because we can't just put things in place and say, good, that's taken care of. We right. have to check in and see right. if it's working. And overwhelmingly, people said to the, the panel, ABA is a lifeline. This right. is life changing. Please help us to get more access to this. And right. And I hope it is on, I think it it might be in their archives. I mean, it was on, on C-SPAN yeah. or whatever the, the TV channel is. And so we might be able to get copies of it because I think it was, it was important to see. Yeah. Yeah. I know that the uh, the last half hour is on the site. That's why I was able to see it afterwards. Right. But right. Um, for that parent and, and for the public comment, because it wasn't That's all awesome. just parents. It was a lot of providers as well. But absolutely amazing. But we want to get to questions because you guys have written in overwhelmingly this week. Uh, I want to start with uh, somebody who would like a little FaceTime with you in each office. Hi, Shannon and Dr. Doreen. Uh, my son is a client of CARD and I know Dr. Doreen is busy, but there is there any way that maybe she can come out and like have a day with parents in each of the facilities, have a parent gathering with one and one only, uh, because they go on to say that you are the only doctor that knows what the mm -hmm. heck you're talking about. Just That's a so thought nice. and That's love you nice. guys. Yeah, I would love to do that. The last time I did that was in, I think, 2010, where because that was our 20th year anniversary and I traveled all over the country and 
literally the entire year yeah in order to be able to go to every site and actually we had a little celebration at every site yeah. with the families and with our therapists our staff I just I love to do that and I, I will I'm I, I can put my personal life on hold in order to do that um, I just can't put my work life on hold right yeah. now I mean card is just going through such an amazing uh, series of expansions and developments right now with not it's not just that we're opening a lot of new offices and locations I mean you know I don't know if I told you that we one of our locations I know these are the things you like to know about yeah. that we just uh, are in the process of opening right now is at Baton Rouge in mm, Louisiana yeah. and it's funny that we started that process and right after we found our, our second supervisor and hired a lot of staff and currently we're in the process of getting the location set up but as we were you know already heavily invested into it uh, the state came out with an emergency uh, plea for ABA providers and now they're basically approving everyone because they have such a, a high need there which is amazing to me but uh, um, and I really like the state of Louisiana actually I mean they're Are the bored. people qualified this is my question. Let me just tell you something, and I don't know, maybe she'll see this, but she, I, the supervisor that I train, I, we just had their supervisor, we did our first round of training for mm -hmm. supervisors. Um, actually, you know, we have one every other month, and this was last, gosh, I don't know, a couple of months ago. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the people attending, that was a pretty large group of supervisors, I think we were training like 17 at that time, or they were just initiating their training. And I have to say, one of my top favorites in that group was the supervisor who will be in Baton Rouge. Awesome. She had been already practicing in the field. And you know, when I when we do these trainings, a lot of times we have very young people who are board certified and they haven't had a lot of experience. But yeah. I will say that Amy uh, was doing a fabulous job in awesome. training and I really liked her her style and her process and I think she's going to be a fantastic supervisor okay. and then of course we have our own senior yeah Kat Minch living there yes. now which is spectacular for that region I mean Kat's incredible she's a genius so yeah she's well, I know the card the people region. will always be qualified I'm worried if they're opening up the state and, and, and yeah yeah you know, I don't licensing know what's a bunch happen. of people I have concerns yeah. about you Absolutely. know people should make sure Absolutely. that they're working with somebody who's had significant training which is what you do at card you ensure right. that right. they do. do yes uh well I will we'll look forward to hearing more about the Baton Rouge office fun. but you know and, and they so, do say I mean, you're to, very busy to respond yeah I mean and I will I hopefully um, and we just got some new management at CAR, so that'll be very helpful as well with Sam coming on full board. So I think hopefully next year maybe I'll be able to do that again. I think next year would make sense because it'll be our uh, 25th. Yeah. Right? Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. That'll be kind of cool. Quite a milestone. Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll look forward to hearing more about that and seeing ways that we can clear your schedule so that <laughs> they yeah, can get more FaceTime. Uh, it's amazing. It really is amazing. I will say that I my son was a client at Card for, I don't know, three and a half years before we met. I met you. Yeah. And I had heard Such so much shame. about you. And and I, you know, I was like, Well, that's great. I hear she's wonderful, but I haven't met her. Yeah, and it right? doesn't matter. I'm I mean, I have, like, yeah, exactly. And then I met you and I went, oh my gosh, they were downplaying it. You're really incredible. Oh, but it, uh, it's such a shame. I hate to hear those things about, like, I just very you're rarely. You're one person. You can't yeah, be in all I places. I rarely get to see the, the kids and that's my favorite thing, so. But I can tell you that on the good note is that what you teach and how you teach and how hands-on you are with everyone from the they top, it, it the kids, trickles yeah. down. It yeah. absolutely trickles Thank down. Thank God for that, though, you know, yeah. and it's taken years and years and a very good clinical direction director as well and very good senior clinicians mm -hmm. I mean I have to say that I think it's not you know we all kind of perfected the process together over the years and I really have to credit the people who've been here for tw over 20 almost 20 years or over 20 some of them have been here 20 years you know and uh, like this year yeah this is Evelyn Kung's 20th year wow you know and, and it's pretty amazing if you think about that that it's crazy. Amazing. So, um, and but then there's a handful. It's not just Evelyn. There's several. You know, Vince, who you mentioned, Vince yes, he's himself be on is. Later. He's been here past twenty years. He's amazing. been here more than twenty years. 
um, Hank and Cecilia and all of these people have been here for a very long time and they are the people that hand it down and make sure that everybody's doing the right thing. Yeah. So it's great. They're, you have, very you have a bunch of rock stars We're and that's lucky. not a coincidence. And you yeah. have people who have, and when you stop and think about when people stay for more, more than 20 years, they stay, that, that becomes your life. Absolutely. And that's because they, they, they're on a mission and they're on a mission with you and you set the pace. And so it does all trickle down. They're that very, speaks volumes. They, well, they're better people than I am. They're very dedicated and they're very loyal to, to me and to the company and to the children. And today I got an email from one of our supervisors in Arizona and it's just like, it really brought me to tears. You know, this is a, a um, very, very good supervisor and she's she does so she works so hard like her she's one of those people that does close to 180 hours a month you know it's crazy she really works very hard and she says she writes in her email that there's a family who lost insurance now because of the state laws and they used to be one of our families who was on a grant with us mm -hmm. and she's saying you know I don't know if act today can help them mm -hmm. if anybody can help them but can I give a portion of my bonus to them Aww. i wish i was like oh my god like that just gave me goosebumps yeah what a wonderful yeah. wonderful woman incredible all right i want to continue on with some questions because we have so many hi dr Please. doreen and shannon my son um has been scripting abcs and songs throughout the day he has high quality aba with a smiley face so supervisor said to tell him quiet mouth so when we say that to him he just lowers his voice is there another way to approach scripting and they said thank you that's such a um that's so funny quiet mouth is something we used to say 100 years ago like literally 30 years ago at ucla it's so funny that i hear those things now yeah there's a lot of things you can do for scripting i, I this is fun it's an interesting time for this question i let me answer this question as i would um, you know, any time prior to two days ago, and okay. then I will answer it because in a different way because I just learned something uh, literally on Monday. Okay. Okay. So typically, what I say for any behavior, obviously, is you try to identify why the child is doing it, and I would say that uh, generally speaking, people consider scripting as a self-stimulatory behavior, and I've always said most of the self-stimulatory types of behaviors are anxiety-related. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something is causing the child to experience anxiety, which is why they start to kind of repeat and do rote behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, you want to try to make the child a little bit more uh, comfortable, less anxious. Watch that. I mean, this does kind of go with what I learned on Monday as well, but I'll come back to that. You know, kind of make, see what environments evoke that behavior, the behavior of scripting. Um, secondly, try to reduce the things that might be increasing the scripting, like for instance, repetitive watching of the same TV shows or uh, I don't know, any anything that the child is repetitively watching where they're learning to model like some of my kids for instance will watch a, a tv show or, or a video or something and they'll keep rewinding at the same place that kind of behavior is just exacerbating the scripting behavior it's sort of very repetitive and makes the child hype up in their repetitiveness so that's one thing the other thing is yes you need to replace it you can't just say quiet mouth i would replace it with something i would for instance uh and again this is i can't give you specific uh directions on this clearly you have an aba provider who's using the term quiet mouth but really you should be replacing it at this point if your child is verbal you should uh, revert to and try to get the child to vocalize because obviously you can't vocally script if you're having a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, if your child's not at the level of having a conversation or answering questions, then you might want to have the child do something else like, I don't know, say the alphabet or something, sing the alphabet, something that would be contrary to scripting. Did the parents say something about what they are the and child scripting. He's actually scripting the ABC. The it's funny okay. you should say that and doing other songs. Um, that that's what he's so doing. So really, all you want to do is okay. I got it. So you not so you just want the child to not do the because it's not. That's not really script. Scripting is usually stuff that's not. 
uh, it's, you know, jargon or, or stuff that doesn't make any sense. So the child is doing what a lot of kids do, which is sing the alphabet, mm -hmm. just not at the right time. Okay. They're doing it at different times, right? And the parent doesn't want the child to repeat those types of things. So, and that's why they've been trying to say quiet mouth. There's a lot of things, depending on how the child's function, like if your child can read, uh, then you really just need to teach them what quiet is and just flash a card that says quiet. Quiet is not, um, you know, or just stop. Right. You, you flash the word stop. Um, uh, here's something very effective. If the child knows that there's a time frame coming up during which time they can sing the alphabet and do all this type of behavior, then they're more likely to be able to control themselves now and, and wait. Um, how do they learn to wait? You have to shape that. So you would have to, for instance, have, let's say, a um, billion ways you can shape it. You could use a timer so the child knows when the timer goes off. Right. You're allowed to read, sing the alphabet. Uh, you could have a little visual schedule that says right now we're doing this and then you'll have a break and during your break you can script the alphabet. Um, you can, all kinds of waiting. There, there are apps on things. your phone that can have a clock with a picture of what they absolutely, get to do when, when the clock goes off. Right, so all you are trying to do is not eliminate this behavior. Let's get that right. You're trying to shape it so that the behavior occurs in very, uh, initially in several but limited time frames okay. and later in very narrow, maybe once a day or twice a day time frames. Right. That's the key to it. Yeah, you because the actual thing, it. there's nothing wrong with the actual behavior. Exactly. It's just doing it at the appropriate time. Right. Okay. And that's very important that it's, there are certain behaviors we do that are not necessarily, you know, they're considered inappropriate only because they occur in social settings. Um, and they're fine if you do them alone, right? Like for instance, I don't know, plucking your eyebrows. I mean, you're not gonna sit at a restaurant and do that with your friends, right? But you do it at a certain time and that therefore it's okay. So with our kids, their behaviors might be odd and might be difficult to manage if you try to cut them off, something else will replace it. It's important to give the child, I think, a period of like an out, like a time frame where they are allowed to do those things and if possible to make it something that fits the norm that is already something that fits the norm so like for instance if it was a child that was just throwing out alphabet in a non-meaningful way then i would actually turn it to the alphabet song and then i would allow the child to sing the song maybe you know a certain time frame of the day because it allows the child to divert so now i'll quickly go back to what i learned on monday i can't I think wait it's important <laughs> I'm I so excited to hear what important. you learned. So it's this whole it's this whole concept of why do the kids do these <clears throat> excuse me these rote repetitive behaviors and that's been a lifelong thing for me. And one of my kids, you know, and I've always said it's anxiety, it's anxiety. So one of my kids, uh, who I was just telling you, is recovering, and I'm so excited because. I did kind of promise the parents that he would about three and a half years ago, and I feel like, yes, I got it. It's you delivered. Happen. Thank you, Marina, our our fantastic supervisor from Torrance, who runs the Torrance office, actually. She's a regional um, uh, supervisor now. But anyway, um, this little guy is fabulous and his scripting behavior was writing letters in the alpha in the in, in in the air okay right writing numbers he was very very obsessed with numbers and he was constantly like and also saying them he was he would count everything everything like uh, count up and going uh, his footsteps okay stairs like anything he could count he would count out loud and this was a very difficult behavior for a long time. Now, I wasn't aware, because I hadn't seen him for about a year, because I only get to see him once a year or so, that he's come to this level of functioning. He's now really fabulous. All his testing is normal. He's doing so great. And he told his mom that he does that, or he used to do that when he was overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that he's used that word, overwhelmed. What a perfect fabulous way yeah. to describe sensory overload yeah so it suddenly occurred to me there's not just you know i of course it's funny how we always like i try very hard to step into my kids 
beings and experience yeah. the world, but I'm still projecting myself onto it, which is why I was like, they probably feel anxious. They just feel really, really overwhelmed, you know, very, very, very overwhelmed. And it's not just anxiety, it's just like they're completely overloaded with yeah. sensory input. And so they do these, some of these things because it's, um, it's like putting a, putting your head in a dark place. Yeah. You know, it's like, he's, he's like, uh, one, two, three, five, three, like he's trying it's to do, he's distracting himself from the overwhelming sensory input. So with him, some of the things that ha that like the supervisors did, which is fabulous, uh, is that they gave him a, a period of time during the day at school that he's allowed to do it. So they said, you know, like you can't do it in class. You can't do any of these things in class. You could do it like at recess, the last 10 minutes of recess when you're in the bathroom or something like that. And so kind of uh, get it out instead of like saying you are not allowed to do this. Right. They gave right. him a period of time to divert it to. It basically doesn't happen. I mean, I didn't see it for a two hour clinic at all. And it's, the data on it shows that it's not happening. Wow. But just to be able to, you know, inc like turn it into a very useful and positive skill, uh, just like our little other friend who took hand flapping and turned it into uh, drumming, drumming uh, I suggested that they teach him Sudoku. Sudoku, I don't know how to pronounce it, yeah. which is all numbers, right? Yeah, the and puzzles. That, yeah, and he's like completely in love with that sort of thing. Oh. And so now he has a number activity, which is actually social and completely fine to do at any, you know, like right. when he's sitting somewhere and it doesn't look appear in any way unusual but it's soothing to him uh, it's extremely soothing just like everything else like yeah why like do some people us. do the crossword puzzle every morning truly I, I mean for me that is my soothing period in the morning is when i get up i make my coffee and the first thing i do is start going through emails yeah and it's not like I have to do it because I have, I mean, I do have to do it because I get several hundred a day, <laughs> but it's, it is a period of time that kind of opens my day. Yeah. And that's, it, that's all it is for our kids too. Sometimes you have to look at some of their self symmetry stuff as that yes. they're, they're, it's a routine that gives them a sense of, you know, comfort and, and, uh, I don't know, they feel safe with it. And it's functional now. It's you just have to make it functional, yeah, right? Absolutely. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. Remarkable. It was a cool thing to realize that, you know, like the, the one he said, I only do that when I get overwhelmed. And I was like, God, we got to remember that. Yeah, so absolutely. Good. Remarkable. I think we should take a quick break and then we'll come back with more of your questions. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampache, learning so much. So thrilled to have her here as a resource for all of us. You can keep your questions coming in on the live feature. Uh, and we, we had one that just came in. Hi, Dr. Doreen. My child, age six, very high functioning, has avoidance escape behavior with the screaming big time big time screaming she recently had a new therapist which allowed her to escape now when we block the escape she knows to scream if she's very loud these throw us back to screaming for every single thing even for a routine that was mastered such as uh best time or nighttime. I think bedtime is what it's supposed to say. How can we work the ground base for this? What do we follow? What should we set? And how, uh, how call, how many seconds do we wait after demand is placed? Please help us in any way. Your advice will be extremely appreciated. Thank you so much. So, um, this is very easy. Okay. Let her scream. Okay. Period. Ignore her. Okay. Just let her scream, especially when you block her from escape. That should be the first one. It's the easiest one. You block her from escape. She starts screaming. Just keep blocking her from escape. It's that simple. She's not able to. She could scream for 40 minutes as long as you have good earplugs. Okay. Put them in and let her scream because she will wear herself out. And everyone needs to let her scream. That's it. This is extinction. This is escape extinction. That is the procedure. It's escape extinction. Okay. So you do not allow her to escape. And if you were to do anything during the time that she's screaming, you would be attending to the screaming okay. and you don't want to attend to the screaming. Now, if it's, if it's a situation where you have told her to do something, 
See, escape is different, right? Escape is she's trying to get out of the situation. You're blocking her. Right. If you've given her an instruction and she's now screaming because she doesn't want to follow your instruction, just it, just pretend the screaming is not occurring and start to motor her through the thing she's supposed to do. Physically motor her gently through the thing that she's supposed to do. Try not to give her any expressive requests so that if you give a demand and she then starts screaming instead of answering you. Okay, so don't give her any demands right now that require her to give you a vocal answer. Because you won't be successful. Yeah. She'll be screaming and you can't, and you can't force her to... Right, okay. But I want to go back to one thing that you said is that have no reaction to it. Have no reaction. So, so that means like, you know, you really... I, it's so hard as a parent. You have to not flinch when she's screaming in your ear. Yeah, you have to although, not jump yeah, back. Right, and that's if that's if she's trying to be... If, if her purpose is attention seeking. Mm -hmm. I think in this case, her purpose is simply escape. Okay. And so, like, you know, it could be bothering you, but as long as you don't let her escape, okay, that's the key to it. All right. And since we're not 100% sure and she might be getting a kick out of the attention as well, like disturbing you, then the, if you can avoid showing any facial response, like you were saying, that would be important. Okay. It's hard. It's very, it's very hard. hard. Be prepared. Have the other therapist with you. If everyone hits it together, and also, please, like, let me just reiterate, you want to get through it faster, place more receptive demands on her. Double up the demands. Okay. Because she'll get more um, uh, practice. Okay, so when so for people who aren't as up on the jargon, the difference between so a receptive and, and an expressive, expressive demand. Is, so, like, you're asking her to do something that does not require a verbal response. Okay, so if you say, come here, yeah, come here that's a receptive bring me the demand. Book. Something that you could physically motor her through if she didn't do it. Okay, but saying, say, Apple, that's an expressive demand. Yeah, because you would then, requ she would have to respond with Apple, and if she screams, there's nothing right. you can do you with can, it. But I love, you got that in two seconds. Well, I've spent a, a lot a, of time trying to... Behavior. Well, I, I, when yeah. I was in the thick of it, I would have needed a book and a, and a tutor <laughs> and a lot of help, right? But I've been sitting here long enough that I'm, I'm much better at all of it. Right. So, so, okay, but really important um, that this is this is an easier one, you said, to get under control. It is. It's, it's very easy. It's, it's tough in terms of, like, it'll, you know, hurt your eardrum. But it can But be. that's an easy one. So what I was saying is if everyone's consistent and if you increase the demands, then you'll get through it faster. Okay. I uh, want to do a quick recap with a parent who wrote in about potty training. Um, I think it was either last week or the week before. Last week. Uh, hi, Shannon and Dr. Reed. I wrote in last week in regards to my son. He's three years and four months old. He has been being potty trained for five months now. We take him every hour and a half, and we provide him a treat every time he's successful. He still doesn't mandate um, for the potty. This is the one that wa they wanted to know last week. Why isn't he manding for the potty? This weekend, he, we, he was having dinner, and I told him, him were going potty when we finished dinner. When I got him up, he peed on himself. He didn't seem to be bothered. Also, he pooped and he just stood there. It concerns me that he doesn't mand for the potty or be bothered by it on himself. He has 40 hours of ABA through card and I swear I follow through. Also, before I give him a bath, I always put him on the potty and as I'm undressing him, he says, all done potty, but I put him on the potty and he goes. I'm confused. Please help. Okay. I... I, I, I so in that particular scenario, so you never really want to mention the word potty unless you're going to do it right then. Okay, so we'll go after you finish eating is not going to work. That's confusing. It's just not going to work because you might be giving, his stimulus is potty and it's just, it's, so it's, this is really quite simple. This is all you need to do. And I apologize by saying it that way. I don't mean it to, I don't mean to be in any way like demeaning by saying it that way, but it is simple and I don't want you to get frustrated with it. This is all you do. I don't know what his current schedule is. Reduce it, get it to the point where he never has accidents, right? And that's the so, like, let's say it's 25 minutes right now, every 25 it's minutes. She said, actually said an hour and a half. Now, that jumped out at me because for a three that's year old, that long. seems too long to yeah. me. So, go back to 
I don't know, an hour and 20 minutes. I mean, hour and 20 is even long for a three-year-old, to be honest. I think they should be probably going every hour. I, I, I got to say that what I recall, and I could be completely wrong, but that we were going every 25 minutes when oh, well, he was when three. You, right. Well, that's only when you're in training. Okay. Yeah. All so, right. Forgive me. If you've already gotten to the point of an hour and a half, then that means he's almost done. Like, he's he's learned to hold it. He's okay. just not learning to man, to tell okay. people. So, again, remember what I had said last week was, first, please, let's get it on a schedule where there are no accidents. Okay. Okay. So that could be going all the way back to an hour. It could be going back to an hour and 15. I don't know what that is. Your supervisor makes that decision. If you're with CARD, I'm not giving you direct advice because <laughs> if I do, I am overriding a, a good supervisor. Who actually is there and seeing what's happening. That Correct. that person's giving child specific Correct. advice. So Correct. we want to be clear about that. And I and let me just say I'm I would be delighted to consult with your supervisor. So if and if, I don't want my supervisors to be egotistical about things. So if you would like to let your supervisor know because I don't know where you are or who your supervisor is, just tell your supervisor you brought it up at Autism Live and I suggested that they should email me. Yeah. And that's that. And then the minute they email me, I'll know exactly what's going on and I'll tell them. But essentially, you reduce the schedule and you get it to a point where there are no accidents. This is very, very important. Before you start trying to get to the point of manding, you have to get on a clean schedule. Okay, so now you're on a clean schedule. When he goes, he goes. And when he's, with, when he's not in the potty, when he's not in the bathroom, he's not actually voiding. He's not having accidents. Then remember, I think what we talked about last week is you should, if you can read, you use a visual cue. Mm -hmm. You start to fade your cue. Right now, it's like potty or whatever it is. I mean, if he's not reading, assume he's reading and you start giving him a visual cue and then you gradually will uh, get rid of that cue. If he is uh, if he's not reading, then you can still also reduce your sentence. You know, your sentence right now is when you're done eating, we're going to go to the potty. It's way too long. You should just have potty as your initial, as your cue, and then you can start fading that to pot, pot, pot and then right. it's gone. So you will verbally, um, you know, reduce your vocalization by shaping it away. And so, and then at that point, if it's still, if he's still not able to, uh, recognize his body cues, then, you know, write back and we'll figure out a way to, like, maybe have a, a vibrating watch or something that gets him to the point where he starts to recognize on an hour or hourly basis that he needs to go. I mean, I should also say, obviously, uh, you should be making sure that he's getting enough liquids. You know, you said something about he doesn't go. I, If you have a three-year-old and they're not going, actually, if they're not like, urinating approximately every an hour and a half, maybe they're not drinking enough water. Okay. Should, look at the color of the urine. It should be pretty clear. I mean, if you ha if it's yellow, he's not hydrated enough. Okay. You know, so those are certain things that you should be watching. But don't try to get him manning until you have the schedule correct. Okay. All right, great. I want to go on to this one about uh, feeding. My five-year-old son with autism used to eat whatever my husband and I were eating for dinner. And now he says, I don't like it to everything. I end up making him chicken nuggets or something else so he will eat. This started in December when we moved and switched schools. Is that the reason? He's also rigid about what he brings for lunch and what he eats for breakfast. He loves fruit and veggies, so that isn't a problem. I would like more more variety in his diet and thank you oh uh, did, did, did the parents say what age five five I don't and I don't know the awareness level I mean it could possibly be that he's aware of what other kids are eating now and he would like to try some of those things I mean I know I, my kids learned about lunchables from school you know I never mm -hmm. knew about them and they told me about lunchables so obviously it's possible that he is now preferring some of the things he sees in schools and unfortunately that's not necessarily healthy things you know right, right. so um but regardless i would say you know pick your battles here the the issue is that he, you need to have um as long as he's eating his fruits his vegetables his proteins uh it's a you know healthy uh diet i suppose uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it being varied. We all have our preferences. Um, I, I know that 
it's understandable and it, it, it's entirely up to you. This is a family decision. If you would like to teach him that he has to eat what you and, uh, and what the adults are eating, then obviously you can shape that and then you wouldn't give in to him. In other words, if he doesn't want to eat, you don't give him another choice. Mm -hmm. That's important. And trust me, nobody will... Um, starve themselves so he won't either he will not stop eating so what will happen is he will just complain 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 and then eventually he'll realize these are my only choices yeah. i wouldn't necessarily do that my pre preference would be to compromise i would say these are you know hey he's still open to these things i'm going to be making sure that he eats these things he's a kid kids don't like to eat green beans you know they, they prefer carrots yeah. so that's perfectly fine most kids are like that 99 percent of kids will not like fish yeah. you know so there's certain things that he's a child and you have to allow him to be that way to some extent now feeding just the key to feeding is it's sort of on a you you allow the child to have you for, you basically teach the child to have uh, i mean this is just a, a short hint that might help you across the board um, for every, let's say, you know, five bites of something you don't like, you can have something you like. And that's, that's the answer, essentially. And, in, you know, you start with have a tiny bit of whatever it is he doesn't want, and then you can have your stuff, all, of, all the rest of your plate. Have two bites of what you don't like, and you can have a plate of your stuff. Have three bites. Then you can have that and then gradually reduce the one he likes and increase the one you want him to have. And that's the whole process. Okay. And, and I would just add, too, that there's more than one different kind of chicken nugget and some of them are healthier than others. If oh, you're gonna, for sure. If you're going to give sure. chicken nuggets, just try to ramp it up and give the most healthy ones. There are some that are incredibly healthy. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh, uh, and then there's know, others that are not that are very so, good. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, uh Continuing on, my, my son is almost four and has started just literally copying kids' moves and speech. What should I do to help him socialize more appropriately? He's at a specialized school, and I've seen them tell him to look at this kid and do it like him during music and movement, so that could be <laughs> contributing. But he just seems robotic lately and not like himself. And he's repeating the kids' speeches she, and actions. Um, she he's, goes on he's doing exactly what they've told him to do. Right. That's what you expect, you know? And yeah. Yes, especially in music and movement, if they're telling to imitate kids. See, that's what he's doing. He's imitating yeah. kids. This is... And if he's... And they have given I, us I their personal the, email. So Okay, good. Um, well, I mean, I just don't... I'm, I don't know that he should be in the special ed environment if he's a child that imitates so well. I'm not even sure he should be in a special education environment. He might benefit from having good models. He might benefit from, is he receiving any one-to-one? -one? This sounds like a child that would learn a lot. Yeah. Who would learn a lot. So maybe... It's, it's a good skill to be able to learn through uh, observation. It's right. one of the skills that we teach. Right. But... You know, if it's if that's all the child is doing, then that's well, I mean, a concern. It, you know, and to help you, I guess it's, it goes back to the other answer, the other question as well, which is sort of he's doing a behavior that they've told him to do. He's just doing it outside of the time frame that he's supposed to do it, or the environment that he's supposed to do it. So I would say. Uh, somehow the school has to kind of signal to him that you only imitate others during this time frame in this class, which okay. is the music and movement. So perhaps when he imitates it, otherwise, you, uh, depending on his level of understanding, yeah. again, not now, and take him to the class and there he can imitate. And he'll begin yeah. to understand that I only should imitate during this class. And uh, uh, quality ABA... I Quality mean, they're talking ABA. about they're talking about having um, this specialized school, but there's no mention of whether it's Quality ABA at home. But Quality ABA at home would be the almost four year old. This would be an ideal child to be having that. Oh, almost four year old. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So um, I really want to encourage you, if you're not already quality ABA at home intensive right. program, right. You're, you're in that window of where that's essential. Okay, I'm going to continue on because uh, we always get towards the end and I get pressured about, I want to answer as many, mm -hmm. have you answer as many questions as possible. Okay. Uh, we had somebody who wrote in um, and said that they agreed with me last week about a teacher who uh, laughed at her child trapped in the chair. Thank you for sticking with me on that. She shouldn't be teaching. Uh, I have a question about my three and a half year old child that is finally making sounds that approximate words while combining with sign language. Mm -hmm. He is language delayed, has some echolalia and articulation problems. However, every time he tries to sound the word, he stretches the sound very long right before the finish of the word. For example, if you ask for a cookie, he would say, can have cookie. She's spelling it out with a, a many, many um, vowels. vowels yeah. And she says, I know it sounds a bit silly writing it like this, but it's the only way I can explain it. The sound of the words becomes very long, almost like he struggles making the sound. Is that normal? No. He does this every time and I will and will do it over and over. Also, is it normal that if I ask him to, to make the sound, for example, the letter P, he can, but he is unable to say a word that has the letter P. Thank you again so much. Yeah, those the, the second issue is pretty. I mean, it's all fine. It's all, he's learning, and it's it's fine. But you, here's let me answer that. You need to teach him the difference between a stretched vowel and a and a short vowel. Like you need to stop it now. So you should be teaching him the difference between cookie and cookie. Like you right. do need to make that differentiation occur. I assume he's in speech therapy. And so the speech therapist should be the one instead of I would have I would have controlled this thing before it even went to I mean he's speaking in sentences can I have cookie or right. can have cookie that's right. three word phrase uh, I would have fixed the vowel issue when it was when he was at a one word utterance so I would fix this right now um, work on that make yeah. sure the speech therapist works on reducing the the sound the drawing out of the okay. vowel. The other issue with yes, he can say, well, they should. That's what they should be working on. See, with every sound that we learn, we first want to make sure that we can produce the sound, like p, and then we want to make sure we can imitate it. So someone says p, and then you do p, mm -hmm. and then we want to make sure that we can use it in all positions. So beginning position, middle position, and end position. So you know, it's very, very different experience to say. Uh, like you know please right which also by the way is completely different because it comes before a consonant so that's right. a different thing as well but like pet versus nap those are very very different experiences so you do need to make sure that the child learns the sound in all positions of different words. This is what speech therapists will do, and ABA people who are trained well can do this as well. We've been doing this for years, but you should get help on. It's very important, and congratulations that your child is actually producing these sounds because if you're at that level, he's going to speak. Yes. Yeah. So um, you have there's no point there's no uh, question that he's going to be verbal, and that's uh, wonderful. Just you just need to shape it. Okay, very good. And then we had an, another question about uh, prosody. Hi, what are the best speech therapy activities for prosody? Can I expect my school speech therapist to provide services for this as well as pra pragmatic speech? I don't know. It varies. There are some speech therapists that are very good. There are some speech therapists that really shouldn't be there, um, like anything else. Same as our field, same as any field. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't... It's rare to have a speech pathologist who is very, very good at pragmatics and very, very good at prosody. Yeah, it's asking but pra a lot. But prosody is extremely important I would suggest we actually have a whole section on prosody and skills yes so there's a lot of ideas there and I would suggest that you get your little um, free sampling of skills mm -hmm. uh, on skills for autism.com and use the the free period to just go in and look at the uh, prosody l And lesson. for people who don't know what prosody is, can you oh, give us a sure. quick? Sure, it's basically the sound of language. Mm -hmm. It's how language changes. Like if I say, um, what is that? There's a there's a very funny saying, that which is the, um, it's very different. They use it for grammar, but it's also yeah. prosody, obviously, which is if you say, uh, let's eat grandma versus <laughs> let's eat grandma. Right. Right. So just that very tiny change in how I said let's eat 
grandma right. that is prosody. That, I was thinking that of Ben Stein. Yeah. Do you remember Ben Stein, who was in that show, Ferris Bueller, and he would say uh -huh. Bueller? Bueller, yeah, and there's yeah. no, it's just all monotone. Uh, he's like the king of, of, of doing that kind of speech. Right. It can it can be for comic effect, but for our kids, it, it prevents them from being understood a lot oh, of yeah. times when they're saying things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And and it's, I think it's it's critical on, in the very early stages to, to work on prosody. Okay, now we have a new feature on the show where as often as possible, we're asking our experts to answer a question in a very short period of time because we have a new segment on the YouTube channel that's the top 100 most asked questions okay. about autism, and we're trying to keep them under two minutes. So, uh, and I hadn't I hadn't pre-warned Dr. Graham Shea that I was going to do this, but we had a question Let's that came it. in on the live feature that was uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask. So the sure. question is, is ABA appropriate for nonverbal children? with autism yes How's okay that? that's so, the fastest I'm, answer <laughs> okay um because it, aba is mostly done with nonverbal children when i when i start with any child the majority of my kids start out being nonverbal Okay. And even if they are nonverbal at age eight or ten, it mm -hmm. doesn't make any difference. There's a billion. We do everything we can. You can change the entire ABA program to a visual program. Mm -hmm. The instructions can be given visually. The response can be received visually. So the whole thing can be visual for non for children who are nonverbal. Okay, so if you have a child who's nonverbal, you absolutely should be doing ABA. Must, must, must do ABA. Okay, thank you for answering sure. that question. Uh, okay, and then in addition to that, uh, somebody wants to know, is it for every child? Yes. I mean, I'll say, I'll be very, I'll just very honestly, it's for yeah. every child. It is for every child. It's for every normal child, too. Yeah. It's for every person. Because ABA is not, it's not a... I don't know how to explain this. It's 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 how we function. Um, you know, I have three typically developing children. Okay, and let me tell you, their entire lives. I did ABA. You do ABA all the time without being aware of the fact that you do ABA. Yeah. Uh, we a parent writes in, we respond to their uh, email, um, and then they are very happy, and therefore they become our uh, continued viewer. What is that? That's ABA. So the parent writes in. That's the behavior. We respond to it. That's the reinforcer, and then we maintain their behavior. We teach them to become a viewer. That's ABA. Everything you do is ABA. You, the phone rings, you pick it up, and you talk to someone. That's ABA. The phone ringing is your, is your SD. It's your discriminative stimulus. That's why you pick it up. You don't just pick up the phone randomly. You only pick it up when it rings. Every aspect of behavior is explained by some antecedent in the environment that provoked it and some consequence that maintained it. And that's all we're saying. That's all we're saying. And so when you apply ABA to kids in general not just kids with autism but in general all you're doing is you're simplifying how you teach them and that's why it works I mean in fact we as I mentioned to you last week we just finished our book um, which is going to be um, and you asked me I think the title on huh? the title of our book is uh, evidence-based interventions for children with autism the mm -hmm. card model okay. and that is hopefully going to be out in six months or so it's being published by Elsevier but now what we're going to do is that we're going uh, to write a book for just parenting lovely because it's all ABA parenting is. is ABA so yeah it's for that everyone. was the first thing I heard this is the best parent training you'll ever get in your life and Absolutely. I went okay I'll sign up for that I want to squeeze one quick question in sure hello my daughter likes to take a bite of her dinner and then run around the house how do I keep her in her chair yes so um, two ways you could do this a hard way is sit behind her and hold her until she finishes okay. and second way is uh, hold her until she takes two bites okay. and then let her go the next day hold her until she takes three um, and then I would probably actually First, no, let me back up. So right now she takes one bite. What you're going to do is you're going to sit behind her and you're going to prevent her from running around until she takes two bites. Okay. Then I want you to stay at two bites, but start removing your own restraint. Okay. So I don't want you to actually have to restrain her. I want her to learn that if she takes two bites, she can go run around. Okay. And then I want her to learn gradually, the next day, week, whatever, that she needs three bites. 
and then she can go run around. Then four. And this process will take a little while. Um, you could also increase it by saying this section of your plate. You could also increase it by, you could actually, another really clever way to do it is put less, put just one bite on her plate. Okay. Okay, and then make it two and make it three and make it four and that's it. So that way she'll be clearing her plate. Okay. So, um, and that's it. Just Slowly. let her, I would shape it. It's easy to okay. do, it just is frustrating for us as parents. Uh, and alternatively, alternatively, you seriously could just tell her not to, she can't leave. I had this with my son when he was very little, he wouldn't eat, he just would not eat. And I wouldn't, and then he would like, uh, you know, uh, his dad, my ex would tell him to go to his room if he wasn't gonna eat. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't really an effective intervention. So I would take his bowl of food and go to his room and force him to eat it. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to, and then, and of course now he eats very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. So, you know, you can't, it's just that the child has to learn what the rules are now. Yeah. That's life. Okay, but I think it's a patient's bone. We need to like have, it really have something that we can purchase that's a patient's bone that we can have implemented. But that's, isn't that parenting? Like, <laughs> it is that, parenting. Yeah. We all need it, a patient's bone. Yeah. Um, it takes a while, but it, you can make progress on it. Thank you so much Thank for you everything much. here today. I just, I, I so Hope enjoy it when you're here. A few families today. Absolutely, I, and we hear back from them all the time. I try That's to send, I, I'm so, I try to send you more and more when you hear back. Thank you. Uh, and when you guys do write back and say, tell Dr. Grandpa Shay, I'm trying to forward more and more of those to her. So feel free to do that. <laughs>